I was telling um, a young woman who was interviewing me that in the 60s, the biggest compliment you could get was you paint like a man. Does that attitude still prevail in the art world or does it even exist at all? There's definitely a range of um, attitudes, either more subtle or more uh, disguised or simply lacking. Hello, I'm Bonnie Urbay. Welcome to To The Contrary. This week, we are honored to have artist Judy Chicago with us as part of our Women Thought Leaders series. Chicago is the woman behind the term feminist art. She's known for the art installation The Dinner Party, which is considered the first epic feminist artwork. It celebrates women's accomplishments throughout Western history, but that's only one of Chicago's artistic achievements. Judy Chicago, thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Uh, you are having what some might refer to as a revival right now. Tell me about it, please. Well, what I would say is I'm really, really busy. <laughs> and this year has been, is pretty incredible. For a very long time, the dinner party blocked out all the rest of my work. And even though I was very grateful for the attention it brought me, I used to say, I hope I'll live long enough to see the time when the dinner party begins to be understood as just one work in a large body of art. And actually, in 2011 and 2012, something happened that blasted open my career, and that was a Getty-funded initiative in Southern California that documented and celebrated Southern California art from the 60s through the 80s when I was living and working in Los Angeles. And at that time, LA was incredibly inhospitable to women artists. I used to be told all the time, you can't be a woman and an artist too. Even, even after you had that big name already? Oh yes, that was part of why I had that change my name. I was telling um, a young woman who was interviewing me that in the 60s, the biggest compliment you could get was you paint like a man. She was shocked because I was one of the only women working in Southern California in the 60s. By the time of the Getty Pacific Standard Time, it was impossible not to include women. So I was in, in like eight museum shows. <laughs> I had three exhibitions. And it exposed people to all of my early work. And so then people started showing my early work. And since that time, the question I can see ha that has been happening is, OK, we now know what she did in her first decade. We know she did the dinner party in her second decade. She's got five decades of art making. Let's see what else she's done. Mm -hmm. So, and this year is just... Yeah, tell me, tell me about the four exhibitions. My husband and I did a piece at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art celebrating the first year anniversary of the museum's new building. And I have, over the course of my career, worked in fireworks and dry ice. And we built a big dry ice installation. And of course, dry ice sublimates or disappears. So in keeping with what we are witnessing, we built the word truth. And then over a period of 24 hours, just like what's happening here in Washington, mm -hmm. the word disappeared. But it turned out... Now, wait a second. You told me off camera before we started you didn't get involved with politics. Sometimes my work comments on political realities, some of my performance pieces, not so much my painting and sculpture, but my performance pieces. But that was fun to do. Okay, then, so that was the end of April. And then, not very long after that, we went to Liverpool, where they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album. And the city of Liverpool engaged with 13 institutions in the city for a citywide celebration. And each of the 
Institutions was assigned one of the 13 songs on the album. Tate Liverpool was given Fixing a Hole, and they commissioned me to do a huge mural on, the, on a grain silo. The mural was 60 feet wide, 40 feet high, and when asked, when the curator was asked, why she selected me, she said, our foremost feminist artist doing a mural for the boys? What would be better than that? <laughs> now, were you up on the, I on couldn't, the grain I, silo? I wasn't allowed on the grain silo, okay? There was a painter. I spent our entire two weeks in Liverpool on the patio of the hotel, which was adjacent to the grain silo, looking through my husband, who's a photographer, looking through his telephoto lens and talking on the cell phone to the painter. <laughs> Blend that. Gary, Gary, to the left, to the left. More gray to the left. Gary, bring that white up there. It was a really challenging way to make art. Is it protected so that it's there for the ages? Now the mural is on the Beatles' magical mystery bus tour. And I hear the owner is thinking about keeping the mural up longer, which will give the painter a in perpetuity job to keep it looking good. Now on to the other installation. You have one here in D.C. I had a show open at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, with which I've been associated for a very long time. And it's a companion show to an exhibition opening next month at Brooklyn. Both shows deal with the dinner party. At the Sackler Center. Yes. Here, we call the National Museum of Women in the Arts NEMWA, which is going to become the repository of my visual archive. They have opened an exhibition called Inside the Dinner Party Studio. They're showing a wonderful uh, film by Johanna Dimitrakis called Right Out of History, The Making of Judy Chicago's Dinner Party. And they have a lot of documentary material and exhibition materials. And they have this one really great little inst installation of slides. Now, Jessica Silverman's show is called Pussies, Judy Chicago's Pussies. And it looks at the overlap in my work between images of female agency and my interest in cats. Well, at this show, what a surprise to see these slides of pictures we didn't even remember of the dinner party studio with all the cats that we had then. Mm -hmm. So that was great. And then next month, we'll be going to New York where they're opening a major exhibition right adjacent to the dinner party called Roots of the Dinner Party, History in the Making, which will be the first major examination of my creative process. So I'm really excited about that. And there's going to be a big catalog for that being published by my New York gallery, Salon 94. So I'm really busy. You are super busy. Now, since the term was coined by you, after you, I'm not sure, feminist art, well, what is it? What I think is it, feminist art? I think it goes back to uh, 1970 when I went from LA up to Fresno, California and started the first feminist art program to help young women try become artists without having to do what I had to do when I was in college and in graduate school and in my early days as a professional artist, which was like excise any hint of gender from my work because it was completely unacceptable. And I wanted to see if I could help young women become professional artists without having to do that. And that, and I called that the Feminist Art Program. And also, I was interested in creating a feminist art practice. It was my biographer, Gail Levin, who looked back, and she had determined that the first use of the term feminist art was in my journals from that period. Does that attitude still prevail in the art world, or does it even exist at all? You mean, does feminist art exist? That, you ha that art, female artists have to excise themselves from 
uh, their work. There's definitely a range of um, attitudes. There are some women who work openly, like I have an Instagram account and I get a lot of people following me and I look at a lot of their work and there are some unbelievable sites now, uh, like Vagina China. I like that. <laughs> anyway, those women don't feel any need to excise anything. They just let it all hang out and it's great to see. Then there are other women, and those are the ones who tend to be more successful in the art world, who uh, are either more subtle or more uh, disguised or simply lacking in terms of female-centered content. Mm -hmm. There's a range. Certainly the art world does not celebrate women-centered art the way it celebrates men. Women's auction prices are way lower than men's work. You know, as I always say, when asked about the importance of the National Museum of Women in the Arts, why do we need a National Museum of Women in the Arts? I say, as long as the Museum of Modern Art is really the Museum of Men's Art with a few women and artists of color tacked on the edges, we need our own institutions like the National Museum of Women in the Arts, like the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. People don't realize how rare those are. When they did the 30-year gala at NEMWA, uh, I posted pictures from the gala. It was celebrating Wilhelmina Holiday, the founder, and I posted pictures from the gala, and I wrote in the caption, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the only museum in the world dedicated to women, and I got an Instagram post back from Russia. And the woman said, really? The only one? Amazing. That is t totally amazing. Now, you, d you talked earlier about your performance art. Yeah. Clearly feminist artists created, they were the ones, uh, yes. you know, Yoko Ono among them, yes. who created performance art. Are you still well, doing it? I did a lot of, as I said, dry ice and fireworks pieces when I was young. In those days, I could just buy colored smokes, and my friends and I could go out to the beach or to the uh, desert, or imagine this, the national forest, and ignite fireworks, okay? Uh, I did that between 1968, I did 30 pieces between 1968 and 1974. Mm -hmm. The last piece I did was in Oakland as part of a sculpture in the city show that the Oakland Museum did. I did a gigantic butterfly form on the shores of Lake Merritt. For a variety of reasons, I had to stop doing those then. But when Pacific Standard Time happened, they had a performance festival, and a lot of artists from my generation were asked to duplicate pieces they had done in the 60s and 70s, but I didn't want to do that. I instead kind of picked up where I left off, and for my 75th birthday, there were exhibitions all around the country, including one at the Brooklyn Museum, and I did this huge butterfly in Prospect Park that 12,000 people saw, and at the end of the piece, they all sang happy birthday to me. <laughs> Was that not wonderful? That what a way great. to turn 75, right? <laughs> when I turn 80, there's going to be a major exhibition here at the <laughs> National Museum of Women in the Arts. And what's that? And are you going to do fireworks? No, I'm not going to do fireworks. There's going to be a major monograph released. My la the project I just finished, it's a major project I spent five years on. It's glass, porcelain, and bronze will be premiered here. Tell me what that is going to look like. It's called The End, A Meditation on Death and Extinction. And I hope that will will help people both grapple with their own mortality in ways that particularly here, is really avoided, but more important, confront what we're doing to the planet and other creatures.
do you think your art has had political impact? And I speak in terms of, for example, women, moving women forward. Well, the dinner party has was seen by a million people in its original exhibition tour that went to 16 venues on six, in six countries on three continents. And since it has been permanently housed uh, at the Sackler Center, that was, was in, in 2007, 20% of the audience that goes to the Brooklyn Museum goes to see the dinner party. So that's roughly 100,000 people a year. And people tell me all the time that seeing the dinner party changed their lives. Describe yes. the dinner party for me. The dinner party is a huge triangular, triangular banquet table, 48 feet on a side. And it, the table rests on a porcelain floor. And on the table are 39 place settings. The dinner party tells the story of Western civilization, much as we all learn it in school except instead of through male heroes, it's through female heroes. And each woman is represent, or figure, historic figure, is represented by a plate that rests on an embroidered or needleworked runner. The plate and runner are done in the needlework techniques and art images and motifs of the time the woman lived. And then each place, each of the place settings around each of the place settings on the heritage floor are grouped the names of hundreds of other women who represent the streams of achievement from which each woman on the table arose because the idea of pulling yourself up by your boots, bootstraps is a myth in terms of achievement. This is certainly true. For example, when the dinner party was premiered, in 1979 at the San Francisco Museum. And it had a huge audience. There was like 100,000 people. A lot of the women who came to see it had never been to a museum. Okay, So they were very confused by the fact that uh, other people helped me. And how did they know that? Because I acknowledged every single person who worked on the dinner party. Because that's a lot of different skills an artist yes. would need. Yes. Would. But instead of appreciating that I was acknowledging all these people, they somehow got it in their head that I'd been t I took advantage of them. And you know why? Because people don't realize that behind the successes of most of the important male artists is a huge phalanx of supporters, assistants, secretaries, dealers, curators, collectors, like way more than I had in my dinner party studio. And so um, it's interesting about the way in which the dinner party challenged a lot of the myths about art. And, and the dinner party taught me about the power of art. I always believed that art had power. But when I saw people weeping and people telling me that the piece, seeing it changed their lives, or when the Sackler Center opened and young women came and they said, I never thought I'd get to see it. I studied it in school. I mean, it showed me the power of art. And, and what, what is going on with feminist art and young women today? It's spread all around the world. It's spread all around the world. You know, like there's a woman artist in Japan who got into all this trouble because she made a vaginal canoe that got, and she got arrested for obscenity. I mean, a lot of the same fights that went on here, you know, around Karen Finley's work, when, and I don't know, all, uh, there are people in the audience who probably don't remember this in the 90s, all of the uh, arguments in Congress around obscene art, you know, that of course targeted women and artists of color and everybody who didn't fit in. Oh, Are you talking about like Ro Robert Maplethorpe? Yes, yes, yes. And I'm thinking, um, you know, and now we're watching a recurrence of that. And sadly, one of the things I've been saying is that the story the dinner party recounts of erasure of women's achievements and the pushing back 
when women came forward, for example, how every child in America does not learn about the suffrage movement of the 19th century, which changed the lives of most women in America. Do we study that in school except in women's studies? Why do we not, why doesn't everybody study that? Because that keeps being this pushing back and we're watching it now again today, you know, and I know one of the things you've kind of been asking me is about political issues but I never wanted to make art that was tied to particular political periods because I wanted to make art that would transcend its period. That's amazing. Now tell me, how did you do your research on, um, for the dinner party in terms of listing the, the names of women who had achieved things? That, that, where they weren't written down at the time of Boudicca. How did you find the well, names? of women in, in ancient history. Yeah, well, first of all, one of the things this show, Roots of the Dinner Party, is going to uh, teach people is about my practice as an artist, which usually starts in research. You know, I've done a whole series of major projects, the Dinner Party, the Birth Project, the Holocaust Project with my husband, um, resolutions, a session time, for each one of those projects, I started in research. And for, for example, when I did a series called Power Play in the 1980s, it's going to be shown in New York at my New York Gallery Salon 94 in January. It's an examination of the construct of masculinity, and this is before gender studies, before queer theory. And so when I went to the library and looked up gender as the first step in looking at the construction of masculinity, the only books that came up were about women, as if only women have gender. So when I started the dinner party, I had already been researching for myself women's history. At that time, the prevailing idea was that women didn't have a history. But I was having all these problems as a young woman artist and decided to look back in history to see if women before me had encountered any of the same challenges and what they did to overcome them. They were written out of history for the most part, right? They were written out of history, but they could be found. But this is how, once I got to the point in the development of the dinner party that I needed help, it was like bigger than what I could do by myself, and I started to assemble a research team. We really had to train the researchers because this is what would happen when they'd go to look for somebody. They would, in a book, it would say about her husband, her brother, her sons, and she was an astronomer. So what we had to do was say, forget the husband, the brothers, and the sons, write down on a card, she was an astronomer. Mm -hmm. And so by going through the books and extracting these little tidbits of information, we were able to assemble profiles of 3,000 women. I wanted a huge compendium so we could choose who would be the best role models for the future, from whom could we learn the most, and then the 999 women who we ended up choosing became the names on the heritage floor. How long do you think women will have to struggle, women artists in particular, because that's what you are, but will have to struggle with these gender-imposed boundaries? Until the end of patriarchy. When do you think that will happen? You're the, you're the... <laughs> the one thing I don't have is a crystal ball. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Judy. That's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.